It is one of the least known stories in American history. It is the story of black achievement and accomplishment. Against all odds, American blacks have built their own institutions, families, schools, churches, and businesses. Against all odds, American blacks have created great art and science, fought heroically in every American war. Against all odds, black men and women have worked endlessly to secure their own freedom and equality. The untold story of blacks in America is a 350-year saga of incredible achievements. This is that story. Hello, I'm James Avery, and welcome to our fourth episode of A History of Black Achievement in America. Now, with the Civil War over, with enslavement in America over, the North and West entered the Gilded Age, an age of great opportunity, economic potential, and fantastic innovation. Seizing this opportunity, blacks participated fully in every aspect of the wild, wild West, became great scientists and inventors. Finally, they exchanged powerful new ideas about their future through the media of the time, newspapers. Now, after the Civil War, the South was devastated. For a short period of time during Reconstruction, political power opened up to the black community. Many blacks, such as Robert Smalls, a Civil War hero, began distinguished careers of service to their people and the nation. The highest right of a citizen, and by far the most important for the protection of a citizen, is the right to vote for the candidates of his choice and to have his vote counted as cast. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of all the states guarantee this right. It is not a question of fitness, intelligence, wealth, or color, or previous condition of servitude, but a right secured by the organic law of the country and bestowed upon all. These words were written by the first black man, a former slave, to hold office in the U.S. House of Representatives, the Honorable Robert Smalls of South Carolina. Robert Smalls was elected to Congress in 1875 and stayed in office until 1887. Five years earlier, Hiram Revels, another black man, had been appointed to fill the Senate seat vacated by Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, thus becoming the first black to join the United States Congress. After the Civil War, most of the newly freed blacks were unskilled field workers. Without money and property, they were adrift in a hostile environment. By some estimates, over 20,000 black men, women, and children were killed by white gangs before federal troops were garrisoned in the South. But after the Reconstruction Acts, many blacks took advantage of their new freedom to gain education and political power. Northern free blacks moved south and were greeted by Southern whites as carpetbaggers. Northern and Southern blacks alike gained many political offices in the South in the ensuing years. They quickly participated in the greater American society with keen skills for politics, business, music, and education. However, when federal troops pulled out of the South in 1877, whites once more gained control of the political processes. Even though blacks lost political power, they had seen what they could achieve and their spirits would never again be suppressed. They now had examples of such men as Robert Smalls who, at one point, stole a Confederate steamship named the Planter, loaded with guns and ammunition, 
and turned it over to Union forces. Later, joining the Union's black troops, Smalls would rise to the rank of captain. In addition to the U.S. Congress, he also served in South Carolina's House and Senate. He died in 1915, an American hero. Many blacks of this time were simply tired of what had happened during enslavement, the Civil War, and its aftermath. They wanted a place to start afresh, a place where history and skin color meant less than skill and ability. That place was the American West. It was the era of cattle drives and cowboys, gold rushes and miners, homesteading and settlers. It was the period colorfully referred to in American history as the Wild Wild West. And blacks participated fully in the settling of this untamed wilderness. At the close of the Civil War, the last frontier of America beckoned to many who were tired of war and politics. They headed west of the Mississippi, bound for places with exotic names like El Dorado, Deadwood, Santa Fe, and Tombstone. They headed for a land rich in timber, grasslands, and minerals. For the black person, the West was a place where their ability meant more than the color of their skin. To former slaves, the West was a place to start over. Blacks fanned out across the West to New Mexico, Arizona, California, Oregon, Washington, Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, and the Dakotas in Montana. They worked side by side with whites as farmers, miners, oilmen, merchants, bankers, lumberjacks, and seamen. And they were sheriffs, such as Bass Reeves, who was one of the most successful lawmen in the late 19th century, working for the legendary hanging judge, Isaac Parker. During the Indian Wars, the 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments, known as the Buffalo Soldiers, earned great respect as cavalry troops on the Western frontier. But the profession that epitomized what the settling of the West meant for blacks after two and a half centuries of enslavement was the cowboy. As cowboys, blacks could experience freedom in ways they never had before. Of the 35,000 men who worked on trail drives and on ranches, nearly 8,000 were black. Former slaves like the famous cowboy Nat Love learned to read brands, rope and shoot, and in Love's case, earned an appealing nickname. Love became known as Deadwood Dick after his exploits in Deadwood, South Dakota. But the most remarkable black cowboy was George Majunkin, known as the Folsom Cowboy. Born a slave on a ranch in Midway, Texas in 1851, after emancipation, he worked cattle drives, finally ending up in the Cimarron Valley of New Mexico. He became foreman of the Crowfoot Ranch, managing a white and Hispanic crew. However, George was not only a cowboy, but also a self-taught naturalist in the tradition of Darwin, Thoreau, and Audubon, also a black man. In this place near Folsom, New Mexico in 1908, George Majunkin made one of the most startling discoveries in all of archeology. span He found a spear point embedded in a 10,000 year old buffalo fossil. With this discovery, later called the Folsom Point, George Majunkin had proved that humans had lived side by side with mastodons and mammoths on the North American continent. 5,000 years earlier than anyone had ever thought. George died peacefully, surrounded by his many friends on January 21, 1922. The question facing blacks in the 1880s was now that they were free, how were they to shape their future? It quickly became clear that to achieve real equality, they would have to do it themselves. 
but what course to take. In the next two segments, we shall see how two conflicting courses of action emerged. In time, that number would double and then triple. And we shall see how the term Afro-American was coined. Most historians would agree he was the most influential black educator of the 19th century. Booker T. Washington was also the knife that divided the black community. On the one hand, Washington's policy of social moderation, technical education, and soliciting support from rich Northern whites branded him and his followers as Uncle Toms. On the other hand were the intellectuals led by W.E.B. Du Bois, who demanded nothing short of immediate social and political equality in addition to black advancement through the sciences, letters, and invention rather than labor. Whatever his failings, Washington was an eloquent communicator about the black experience in the second half of 19th century America. About Reconstruction, Washington wrote in his autobiography, Up From Slavery, I felt that the Reconstruction policy as it related to my race was in a large measure built on a false foundation, was artificial and forced. In many cases, it seemed to me that the ignorance of my race was used as a tool to help white men into office, and that there was an element in the North that wanted to punish Southern white men by forcing Negroes into position over the heads of Southern whites. I felt the Negro in the end would be the one to suffer. The event that would change Booker T. Washington's life occurred in May of 1881. He was offered an opportunity to take control of a technical school, an opportunity which he excitedly took. So in July of that year, at the age of 25, Booker T. took over the Tuskegee Normal Industrial Institute in Alabama, a trade school. Beginning with only two shacks for the campus, he would develop it into a major black educational institution. Tuskegee and similar schools paved the way for blacks to move from field workers to industrial laborers. At his death in 1915, he was both revered by those blacks who owed him their livelihoods and reviled by those other blacks who felt held back by his appeasement policy. However, that he was a great force in American history cannot be denied. Never had a floor, just what you see. And I grew up here. Never had a floor. My old great great aunt, Top Fear Moss, was her name. That's what she cooked. She had two beds in there, one bed and one bed. With the end of Reconstruction and the passage of the Jim Crow laws in the South, it was clear to many blacks that equality would not happen naturally. Equality among the races in America would only take place if blacks themselves made it happen. One man who saw the long and bitter struggle ahead was T. Thomas Fortune. In 1884, he wrote that it was time the colored voter learned to leave his powerless protector and take care of himself. Timothy Thomas Fortune was born on October 3rd, 1856 in Mariana, Florida. Young T. Thomas was attracted to the newspaper business at an early age. Later, he worked as a typesetter for a black newspaper in Washington, D.C. There, Fortune met the editor of the People's Advocate, John Wesley Cromwell. He mentored Fortune and urged him to start his own newspaper in New York, the New York Globe. It became the leading black journal of opinion in the United States, crusading against separate schools for blacks and whites, denouncing segregation, and demanding that the U.S. government and the Supreme Court uphold black civil rights. It was during this time that Fortune coined the term Afro-American as a substitute for Negro, 
arguing that blacks were African in origin and American in birth. T. Thomas Fortune was one of the first to understand the power of the media in forcing the drive to equality between the races. He gained a reputation as an agitator because he advocated immediate equal rights rather than the accommodation policy of Booker T. Washington or the intellectualism of Du Bois. Over the years, blacks such as Ida B. Wells Barnett, Thurgood Marshall, and Martin Luther King Jr. picked up the mantle of Fortune's position, forcing America to accept civil rights for blacks. History proved Fortune correct, but it would be a long and bitter struggle constantly using the media to stay on message of immediate equality, to bring about America's transition to education, voting, opportunity, legal protection, and freedom for all. Perhaps the area of greatest black achievement has been in invention. Nowhere else did blacks use opportunity more than in providing the nation and the world with the incredible devices of the late 19th century. Helicopters, air conditioning units, refrigerators, cellular phones, fire extinguishers, pencil sharpeners, traffic signals, dust pans, toilets, and many more, all part of the steady stream of products created by black inventors. In an interesting twist of fate, the U.S. Patent Office never asked what the inventor's color was. In the latter part of the 19th century, blacks, through self-education and their inventions, could rise to economic success. It was, in fact, the great era of invention and technological transformation in America. Men such as Tesla, Edison, Westinghouse, Bell, and Granville T. Woods took Maxwell's electromagnetic principles and electrified the world. Born in Columbus, Ohio on April 23, 1856, Woods, like many other backyard inventors, learned his skills on the job. He got a job as a fireman, eventually becoming a train engineer. He spent his spare time studying electronics and the thermodynamic principles of steam engines. In 1880, he settled in Cincinnati, Ohio, where he founded the Woods Electrical Company. In the following years, he sold many of his inventions to the country's fastest growing corporations, American Bell Telephone Company, General Electric, and the Westinghouse Air Brake Company. His invention of the overhead electric conducting lines for railroads led to the development of overhead railroad systems found in modern American cities like Chicago, St. Louis, and New York. Wood's best known invention was in 1887, the synchronous multiplex railway telegraph, which allowed moving trains to communicate with stations, dramatically reducing the number of train accidents. With over 60 patents, Granville T. Woods was indeed in the same league with Thomas Edison. Ida B. Wells Barnett showed the black community how to use the media to advance black causes. She showed how blacks as a group had political and economic power. It was the most heinous of acts the lynching of black people by whites. There was no due process guaranteed by the Constitution. It was a practice that could only happen because that sense of other, that sense that blacks were inferior, were property, had not disappeared with the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. If this were to change and blacks were to get the rights and justice laid out by the Constitution, they would have to make it happen themselves. 
After Reconstruction ended in 1876, more than 4,700 black men, women, and children were dragged from their homes, strung up, and murdered, often for no more an offense than speaking their minds or being successful. Someone needed to make these dark and hidden deeds known to the entire country. That person was Ida B. Wells Barnett. Ida B. Wells Barnett was born in Mississippi in 1862. Growing up during Reconstruction and its aftermath, she witnessed the depth of hatred against blacks and the gradual dissolving of their civil rights, particularly due process under law. Wells Barnett began her crusade against lynching in 1892 after three of her friends, Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Henry Stewart, were lynched in Memphis, Tennessee, simply because they ran a grocery store that was more successful than their white competitors. In 1893, using her small Memphis newspaper as a pulpit, Wells Barnett courageously attacked the white supremacists who incited the lynching of blacks. Ida Wells was, as her biographer refers to her, the lonely crusader. She spent a good deal of time trying to publicize lynching, both to uh, whites, particularly in the North, to politicians, and to blacks throughout the country. What she wanted to do was to force the government to deal with the lynchers, to make lynching illegal, bring them to justice. And she did this in a variety of ways. She did it first as a newspaper reporter and an owner. And she was so charismatic and so vital that her first newspaper in Memphis uh, was too strong for the white population and they ran her out of town. But she then went to work for one of the best known black newspapers of the time, the New York Age, and continued to uh, publicize lynching. And as I said earlier, what she wanted was a political response, that is the politicians to control and um, punish or at least arrest people who committed the lynchings. And her publicity campaign was also designed to tell the black community how they should respond to lynching. And she's interesting in the sense that she says, we need to publicize this. We need to publicize this as being illegal. We need to publicize this as being barbaric. Uh, we also need to get the uh, white political leaders at the local level, the white economic leaders at the local level, and force them to control the white mobs that do the lynching. And uh, she also threw a little wrinkle in there that she called part of the black response, and that is migration. And that was if the white political authorities didn't control lynching, then blacks should leave the community and go find places where they could work and their liberties would be respected. And she not only publicizes lynching, but she also starts to publicize what later becomes known as the Great Black Migration. When most Americans learned of the lynching of blacks, they were horrified. Consequently, following Wells Barnett's campaign, the number of lynchings lessened from a peak of 235 in 1892 to 107 by 1899. An anti-lynching legislation was enacted in parts of the South. While blacks in the North and West participated in the Gilded Age, the South, by the end of the 19th century, reverted back to its old ways and entered the era of Jim Crow laws. In 1896, the Supreme Court of the United States rubber-stamped the principle of separate but equal, 
for blacks and whites in southern states. The ruling legalized segregation throughout the nation. Racial hatred would persist for another three quarters of a century. When federal troops pulled out of the South in 1877, whites quickly found legal ways to deprive blacks of their equal rights and went on to pass a series of Jim Crow laws, making it illegal for blacks and whites to commingle. They could not share the same restaurants, schools, trains, and public and private institutions. In 1890, Louisiana passed a Jim Crow law requiring railroads to provide separate cars for blacks and whites. Homer Plessy challenged the law by sitting in a whites-only car and was arrested. Plessy claimed the law violated the 14th Amendment Clause of Equal Protection under the law. The state of Louisiana argued that blacks received equal treatment, just separate. The case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Just as John Marshall Harlan wrote the minority dissent, our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens in respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. But the court's majority sided with the state. The majority opinion said, We consider the underlying fallacy of the plaintiff's argument to consist in the assumption of that the enforced separation of the two races stamps the colored race with a badge of inferiority. The argument also assumes that social prejudices may be overcome by legislation. We cannot accept this proposition. Legislation is powerless to eradicate racial instincts or to abolish distinctions based upon physical differences. If one race be inferior to the other socially, the Constitution of the United States cannot put them upon the same plane. Thus, the federal government abandoned the blacks' cause of integration into American social and political life, leaving this divisive issue for succeeding generations to solve. In the next episode of A History of Black Achievement in America, black culture moves onto the national stage and an American black becomes the first person to reach the North Pole. Thanks for watching. I'm James Avery.